In this episode of Personal, we are chatting to the wonderful Sarah Pittendrig, who is just everything, an entrepreneur, an author, a mentor, a podcast host. One of the questions will be, how do you keep up with everything? Um, and also, you've developed this amazing I Can method. And also, this is the book, the fabulous book that Sarah's written. I highly recommend it to people. Not only has it got Sarah's amazing story, but also it has the I Can method within it. Um, and I have a, quite a lot of unique insight into your life, which I don't often have with other guests, <laughs> yes. thanks to this book. So the questions might be a little bit more detailed. Uh -huh. um, so we should perhaps just get going. Um, you've faced many challenges in your life, many of which I've read about in your book. Mm -hmm. Which was the toughest to go through? <clears throat> well, it's, it must be cancer. That has to be the toughest because your health's your wealth. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have that, and as a mum, to, you know, the biggest fear wasn't about my, me getting cancer. It was about me not being here for my son. Mm. So I don't think anything would top that in terms of the biggest challenge. I needed to stay alive. <laughs> Absolutely. And I love that your health is your wealth. Yeah. That's so important. So many people put kind of material things above it and actual no. money as wealth, but it's not. You haven't got it? your health. It doesn't matter how much money you've got in the bank. You'll just be the richest corpse in the graveyard. Absolutely. What's the point? Yeah. And when you say that word rich, people think yeah. of it in terms of money, but it's yeah. not. It's yeah. rich in terms of life experience, right. in terms of love yeah. and everything. So that's a, a great answer. Yeah. Reading a lot of your book, there's this saying that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yes. Now, would you agree with that? Uh, yes. Yes. Because cancer didn't kill me yet. And it had, it's had two goals. So, um, and I'm definitely stronger. And all of the other things, because I'm not, I'm not allude to them, because you might want to talk about them, so I don't yeah. want to spoil it. Mm -hmm. um, they've taught me lessons. I think there's so many lessons in, in adversity if you're prepared to take a step back and look at the landscape of what they offered. Adversity for me has always been looked upon as opportunity. That's a great mindset. Um, one line in your book that really stood out to me, I'll kind of read it, I might not get it exactly right, but I had no bank account, no mm. checkbook, no credit or debit cards. <laughs> That's just mental. Yeah. How do you live life oh, without those things? Horrendous. It was horrific. And... You know, my house had been repossessed. So I was living as a squatter, not knowing when they were going to, oh, you know, come and take it, when we would be thrown out. And the only income I had was income support. So because I was on income support, my son ended up getting free school meals, so that helped. And then you, there's all these different things that you can get support with, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of helping you with bills and things like that when you're on income support. But the reality was that that was it. You know, it was you literally waited once a fortnight to get the little checkbook thing through the post that you could take down to the post office in those days. I'm sure it's all online now. And you'd get your cash and you would make it make it last, basically. <sighs> crazy especially mm -hmm. probably living the life you live now compared to the days when and you know I, I didn't say it but when you were bankrupt it's yeah. such a horrible word to say it is, it's harsh isn't yeah. it yeah um, very harsh because I wasn't just bankrupt money I was bankrupt mentally as well mentally and emotionally mm. so you know people think you're bankrupt because you've got no money but what came with that for me was I was just absolutely bankrupt completely I was just a shell really if it wasn't for my son who was my motivation I'm a driver. I don't actually know where I'd be now. Oh, it's incredible to see how you've turned that into a positive situation. It's motivated you through it. Yeah. But do you think that's affected your relationship with money today? Uh, yeah, I think sometimes I've got a bit of a money mindset issue and I need to sometimes sort my shit out. I don't know if I'm not as well on this podcast. You are. Sorry it's about that. <laughs> <It's brilliant. laughs> uh, sometimes I think I have and then sometimes I think I haven't. It's a funny one. Um, I think I've sometimes got blocks around it. Am I as Am I bold and brave? Yeah, I am. So it's not really that necessarily. But I just sometimes think I could be kinder to myself with money. So for instance, I, I would rather spend it on others and always be reinvesting for growth than do something for myself that could be truly wonderful. You know, so rather than, you know, maybe take myself off on a fantastic holiday or buying something amazing just to, to treat myself or to do, I would always think there was somewhere better place to spend the money before I would spend it on myself first, maybe. I don't yeah. know. I'm not sure. 
Oh, that, sure. that's a shame because you <laughs> you deserve it. I mean, I have a good life, don't get me wrong. And if I want things, I get them. But I think I always, I ponder, you know, am I worth it? Am I worth it? And the reality is I work bloody hard, I am. Mm. But I think that probably comes back from the, you know, losing it and being very conscious of how I spent money moving forward you know yeah does that affect how risk of issue you are say if you're getting involved in a, another business venture are you because it could go one or two ways yeah. couldn't it like yeah. either I wouldn't say I'm risk averse what I would say is I make bloody good informed decisions <laughs> yeah. fantastic um now I really love happy ending yes. and one thing I loved learning about in your book is how you got remarried to your ex-husband father yeah. of your child your childhood sweetheart yes. almost yes um and People often talk about your wedding day being your your kind of best time of your life. Yes. Was the, the second day you got, the second time you got married, was that the second best time of your life? Well, I'm not going to bullshit you here because the reality was we'd both been through a lot. So um, when we got married the second time round, um, I was obviously recovering from from losing the business and, and we'd um, worked tirelessly to... Um, for me to build the my Simply Bowls and Chair Covers business. At the time be, before we got married, Stuart had lost his mum and his dad to cancer. So I wouldn't say that we were absolutely in full celebration mode. I would say that we got back together and we were um, a support network. We collaborated together to get through what I would say were, were some really dark and challenging times. Okay, so did you have a ceremony to... Yes, we did. Yeah. We had a lovely little way. It was very small. It was, I say very small. It wasn't very small. It was six, there was about 60 people there. And, um, and it, was, it was lovely. It was at Close House, which was a venue that mm -hmm. Simply Bows did all the, the, the wedding Great. Uh, styling and so forth. And it was beautiful. It was really, really was a lovely, lovely day. But I don't think... I think both of us were exhausted. Mm. So it was still... It wasn't sort of, you know, high days, holidays and, and, and celebrating. I think it was more... My God, we've made it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm honest. Did you have a honeymoon or anything? A second one? No, I don't think we did. Do you know yeah. what? I can't even remember. <laughs> Isn't that awful? Because that's the state we were in. Mm. That was the state we were in. It was like just focusing on building Simply Bows and Share Covers because it was in 2012. It was only um, nine, three years after... Mm -hmm. um, after um, I, we'd lost the other the, the co-directors and I had lost that other business, uh, previous co-directors, obviously. Um, and, and Stuart had just lost his mum and his dad. And he was at that pivotal point with his farm as to what he was going to do moving forward. Yeah. Um, so I don't I don't believe we did. But at that time, I was I was fortunate to be winning lots of awards and I was in and out of London and there was so much going on. And we had the horses and stuff. So we were competing. William was competing all over with them. So we, it wasn't really, we didn't really have time for anything like that, I don't think. Wow. And William must have been really happy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> William's a funny thing. William enjoyed being with his mum on his own for 10 years. Oh. He was, um, you know, my absolute, well, he is my absolute world, you know, oh, and centre of that. attention. Mm. And he's 23 and he's still my absolute world, oh, the centre of attention. Yeah. So I think it was a little bit for him. It was a bit like, oh, I'm not so sure if I'm so keen on you coming back full time. You can pop in and out, but I don't know if I want you. <laughs> I'm the man of the house kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? But it was, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's all good. But, you know, it, mm. it was interesting because as I say, William and I have got a very, very strong bond and uh, those 10 years we had together, we, we did enjoy it, I must say. Oh, I think that's <laughs> lovely. And I bet you had spectac spectacular chairs at your wedding. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> I must say we did. It was absolutely beautiful. Yeah, I brought out some new designs, especially for that. So that was, yeah, it was really lovely. Fantastic. Yeah. Just touching on that that side of the, oh, mm. we're not allowed to talk about because I need to bring myself oh, in there yes, a little yes, bit. Yes, <laughs> Sorry yes. about that. Yeah. That's my bad. <laughs> um, moving back onto the, the kind of married subject, the second yes. marriage subject. Yeah. You mentioned that it was at a tough time yeah. where your in-laws had passed away. Yes. But you didn't always have a great relationship no. with those. No, not at all. Mm. No, it was very, very challenging. Stuart was an only child. Mm. And coming from a farming background, as he did, and um, and they were big into the horses, and, and Stuart was a main sort of the, the, the kingpin of that, really, because he was riding for them. And... Um, and I think they looked at the fact of if Stuart got married and moved away, everything that they wanted and everything that it was all about what they wanted and 
um, I think it, it was a threat that it would that all the cards would come tumbling down rather than you know embrace it and enjoy it and do so I was I was seen as an absolute threat and it was not comfortable at all no yeah. not 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 comfortable relationships at all yeah you mentioned they were very controlling very uh -huh. yeah. yeah they were and um and 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 quite unkind to be honest quite unkind mm -hmm. and I think that the, if it was me now the older and more mature me who's who's you know come through so many decades of 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 wars if you like but learned from from all of the each each war um each battle I think I would be much stronger and I would handle it so much more differently whereas before I let them get under my skin and they crushed me a little bit mm. what sort of things did they used to do that were unkind to you well in the book you'll see there was things like um Stuart was an amateur jockey and he would um you know, be going racing sometimes and I would be going down thinking I was going with him, all dressed up and excited to be going. And one day I walked into the kitchen and it was like, literally, as soon as I got there, I looked up and down and his father was like, well, you're not coming. There's no room in the car for you. So you just need to turn yourself around and go back home. I, I was shocked when I read you know, that. And I was like, and I can still feel that now. I can still feel that stab that hit me there. But because I was young, I, what would I have been? Would I have been 20? And, you know, I didn't have a lot of self-confidence then anyway. I think it was looked at Stuart, hoped he was going to say something. He didn't. And it was like, I just think I just looked and didn't even argue, turned around, tears stinging my eyes till I got out of the house, got in the car and just, you know, broke my heart. But I didn't want to show that vulnerability in front of him, you know, that pain and those tears. So I just was like fair enough kind of thing and, and walked out and, and it was just dreadful. I mean, you would ask, why did you, why did you continue to stay in that environment? Why did you continue to stay in that relationship? Why did you even marry that person <coughs> really mm -hmm. on the back of that? But I think the reality was I was in a very different place then to who I am now. Definitely, you know, 20 years old. Yeah, exactly. I think a lot of people would have been the same. Yeah. I mean, what would you put yourself in that situation now, yes. knowing everything you know yeah, and yeah. the confidence you have, yeah. what would, how would you respond to that situation differently? Very interesting. I would either turn around to Stuart and I'd have said, either speak up now and tell him he's staying at home and we go, or I walk out this door and you don't see me again. Mm. Simple. Yeah. And do, do you ever replay situations like that in your mind or is you know, too much water nah, under the bridge? just let it go. But yeah. if it ever happened again mm. in any situation like that, I've got so much more respect for myself to allow anybody to treat me like that again yeah good for you and do you ever talk about it with Stuart now like it does because yes. I, I feel your pain uh -huh. reading that yeah, like, sometimes why? I berate him I was still good, good. yeah I wanted him to uh -huh. fight for you yeah I did as well it. that's what I wanted that's what I wanted all the time for him to fight for me does it how does he did, does he say why he didn't well I think he just seems to think he was ruled you know by his parents you know that I suppose they were his father he felt was quite what do you say bullying and intimidating I'm not quite sure he says that he says that he, he wouldn't stand up for them whereas he would now I suppose he was young as well you know and um I don't know I think he was probably afraid because the farm was his livelihood you know it was his business and you know it was a it's what he believed at the time but and he didn't have that wealth of knowledge or experience to to see it for what it really was yeah and how do you do that yeah, and, and not only the, the ages, but it was very different times as yeah, well. Yeah, very different times. Um, you know, we're talking, then it's, we're talk God almighty, we are talking 30 years ago and more. That is super scary. I know. Uh, yeah. And yeah, and it was very different then. Mm -hmm. But yeah. you're happy now and yeah, made it all, yeah, well, really glad. Yeah, yeah, things are all good, you know, and it's, we're very blessed. We're very lucky. <coughs> we've, got a, we've got a nice little life, you know, um, and that's what you've got to be thankful for, haven't you? Oh, definitely, definitely. And did you, do you feel that now you've fully forgiven the in-laws for how they were no not really yeah. no I haven't and I don't see why I should because I never got an apology I never that got was a be one of my questions you know yeah. I never got an apology or we were wrong and we we see that you had his best interests in heart and or, or whatever mm. or, or dude you know it was um no I don't um I don't I don't forgive them I think they were they were very unfair and very unjust Sorry to interrupt, but just a quick word about our sponsor, Be Daily. 
I've been subscribing to The Bee Daily now since starting my business. It provides relevant and informative information directly to my inbox, not just about the Northeast, but also national news. If you're interested in subscribing, we'll put the link in the description box so you can get the business news directly to your inbox. Now back to the podcast. So this is probably a very cruel question uh-huh. then. Were, were you pleased that they died? No. Okay. No, I definitely wasn't pleased that they died at all. Um, and I, I, I didn't, I wasn't... Um, sort of back with Stuart in time, really, while his father was very ill. We only kind of got back together towards the end of, of his illness. Right. But his mum, Stuart and I, were back together. And I would like to say I did my very, very best for her. I'm in, sure you did. In terms of caring for her, mm-hmm. making sure she had the best care and um, the best support. And I did all of that for her, you know, and... Um, and you know, and I, I and I do believe that she was grateful for that because, interestingly enough, I was one of the few people that she would actually allow to speak to the consultant and advise and support her. So I believe she did really trust me in the end. Um, but then that still ties back to the forgiving. I don't see why I should still forgive them for how painful, you know, they made life for me. But I would like to think I have compassion and enough empathy to make sure that she wouldn't suffer or to be in any pain or anything. So I I would like to think that her end of days, I showed huge compassion and empathy and support for both her and to Stuart, you know. That's wonderful. He's definitely the, the bigger person in that respect. I'm, just, mm. I'm sure, I like to think she's sorry she just didn't say it. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't mm. mean that I don't think, you know, it, it doesn't affect me or anything like that. But, um, you know, you don't always have to forgive people. You can move on, Mm -hmm. but you don't have to say, oh, it was all right. I let you off. It was okay that you caused all that pain and that upset. It doesn't matter. I'll just forgive you. You can still hold, you know, you you don't, I don't believe you have to forgive, but you can move on. I'm still angry, but you can move on. Yeah, I like the way that you are like that because there is a lot of pressure in today's world to, to forgive. Yeah, you know, and quite often people do say they've forgiven, but there's mm-hmm. still that resentment. Yeah, exactly. So away. just be honest about it. Just yeah. say, no, I haven't forgiven. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel this, but I'm I'm very happy to move on. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't mean what you did was right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do so. We, you talk a lot about animals in yes. your book, and I love animals as I well. Do. I think we're both big dog lovers, <laughs> yes. and we've got border terriers yeah. in the family. Yes. Um, you talk about your dog, your uh, amazing dog, yes. with Sam, oh, yeah. and horses. Yeah. Do you sometimes feel you have a better relationship with animals than people? Absolutely. <laughs> God, there's no question about it. <laughs> uh, Sam, my lurcher, I could rely on him like. All, 24 hours a day, he was there by my side. He was my sounding board. He was my comfort blanket. He was just there for me through the hardest, hardest times. And so reliable, mm. you know. And, um, yeah, I mean, I've had a, I've got a great relationship with animals. I mean, there's some good people in my life. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to be that harsh. But I <laughs> must say, I do. I, I do. I, well, for example, I work from home. And I've got now, because unfortunately I lost Sam. I know, I remember. Heartbreaking. Really recently, wasn't it? Was, it? it was, it was, it uh, was, God, I can't even remember now. It was in the pan- pandemic. It was yeah. in the pandemic. I remember died. speaking to you about yeah, it. You were just it was, absolutely I, devastated. I couldn't, I couldn't even think straight for so long. But no. we've now got a crazy Dalmatian, which my son decided to buy in the pandemic. And I got another little lurcher. And I spent all day with them. One's on the sofa in my office and the other's on the chair. They have the designated seats and they are my companions all day long. You know, so, um, yeah, they're, they're great fun. What do they give you that people can't? I know you mentioned a sounding board. Yeah. I get it. It's people who don't have animals. Yes. They're like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, I talk to them all day. They, they just look at me, but I feel better for getting it off my chest. <laughs> oh, brilliant. But you feel as, I know we'll come on to the spiritual yeah. side of things later, but yes. I feel that they have that quality in them. They don't yeah. have to say anything back, no. but you, you know they feel you. And yes, they you really do. They do, and they're a very good judge of character, I think, as mm. well. Mm. I think they are. They've, uh, they say a lot without saying too, too much. Yeah, yeah, totally. Did you have um, Sam when the in-laws were still alive? Or? Uh, did I? Yeah, I must have had Sam. 
was just wondering if you got yeah, on with them. I must them. have had some. Well, they, would, they didn't really come to my okay. house mm-hmm. very often, so yeah. he didn't uh, have much to do with them. Yeah, and the horse that you talked about in your book that you had oh, to sell. Yeah, God, oh, gosh, that broke my heart. Do you still think? Is it, do you know if the horse yeah. is still alive? No, he died. Oh. My gr- lovely grey horse, I actually, um, I actually put him out on loan. It was just before we were losing the other business, mm. the, the, my ex-partners and I. And um, there was just so much going on that I... <clears throat> I, I let him go to a lady who'd been coaching me for side saddle. Just It was just meant to be kind of a temporary thing. But unfortunately, he went lame with her and ended up having to be uh, uh, put mm-hmm. to sleep. And um, I mean, h- yeah, hindsight, if you can turn the clock back, turn the clock back, I would never have let him go. It wasn't her fault or anything like mm-hmm. that. I just wouldn't have let him go, you know. But yeah. I wasn't in the right state of mind emotionally or yeah. or anything like that. And I just thought, well... It was the right thing for him just to do something and, and and be enjoying life rather than just hanging around waiting for me to to get my shit together again. And uh, yeah, he was um, he got me through like because he was before Sam, so he was the he was the sort of journey before Sam. He was the journey of when we were losing the other business, and um, you know, riding him was like my escape and. He, he, you know, and when I got divorced, I got him after I got divorced and things like that. And and he he was re- we really did have a mega bond. So when you go back to, you know, how horses and animals and things, my mm. grey horse got me through losing the you know like the the turbulent time when the business when you were going to lose the other business, mm-hmm. and then my dog got me through the next stage of starting again after bankruptcy. You know, so animals have played a mega mega part. And yeah. keeping me on the straight and narrow mentally. Yeah, and, and are, are your kind of current two dogs? Are yeah. they? You know, are you going through oh, any challenges at the them. minute that they're helping you with? Um, am I going through any challenges at the minute? I'm going through a lot of challenges at the minute, but they're not business challenges. They're more personal challenges. Mm-hmm. It's more about just sorting out different things about what we're doing and where we're going and and what we want to do as a family and moving forward. You know, just sort of planning and doing for the future. And so it's really nice to take these dogs out every day. We live near a forest, so you know I, I go out there and a minimum of an hour every day just watching them galloping and bounding and having fun and the freedom that they have. It's it's just really great for that growth thinking, you know, that space you need to declutter. Mm. Um, yeah, so they they play a, a big part in uh, in that for me. Fantastic, and you mentioned they're going outside. Yeah, and I know there was a period in your life when you were so mm. anxious you couldn't oh, even leave the house. Yeah, it was really bad. Couldn't even couldn't even leave the house at all. But it was weird because I couldn't leave the house, but I also couldn't stay in the house on my own. So it was like I was really pr- a prisoner. You know, even just saying that there, that that nearly that nausea nearly came there of what that actually felt like because it was like being controlled completely through fear mm-hmm. and anxiety. It was just absolutely horrific, a but horrific time. For people that don't understand that, is it called agoraphobia? Agoraphobia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How, what was so frightening about mm-hmm. leaving the house? Y- you can't understand it at the time, mm-hmm. but now, I've, now, now I'm here where I am and I step back and I've analysed it all, you know, through writing my book and creating the ICANN method and, you know, blah, 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 working it out. It's about feeling safe. People who have agoraphobia, I think, don't feel safe. I can't generalise, but I think many people who who have it don't feel safe in some element of their life. And I just got married, and I actually didn't feel safe. Really? Nothing to do with my husband being horrible or anything like that. Mm. You know, he wasn't like, you know, he was wasn't that sort of thing. But I just didn't feel. I felt very insecure. You know, I'd had that awful carry on with his with his parents and everything and leading up to the marriage because they didn't wed and they didn't want us to get married. And my granny and granda, who were like uh, my real rock, had um, both died. And my granny had just recently died um, in the summer of the year I got married. And so, and then, um, so I'd lost a lot of like people, a, a really close, secure network. And I think that kicked it off when I lost my granny and granda. And then um, after that, the the sort of carry on with Stuart's parents, then getting married and then having this mortgage, which wasn't huge, thank goodness, because bless my granny, she'd left me, you know, some money to, which I used to, to buy the house and stuff. But all of a sudden, I just felt this overwhelming sense of responsibility, this sense of loss, this sense of had I done the right thing? Why did I do it? And I think I just became so overwhelmed 
with everything that before I knew it, this, this, this thing, this cloud had crept over me. And I think through sort of depression and anxiety, and as I say, just feeling so consumed by this loss and feeling of lack of self-worth, I think I just got to a point where I thought if I step outside, everybody just is staring at me. Just, you know, they don't like me, they're, they're this, they're that, I'm not worthy. It was just all these awful things going on. And it just took quite a bit of time to, to break out of it, really. That's awful. So you were sat feeling unsafe in the house, mm. feeling unsafe going outside. Yeah. What did you do? How did you pass the time? It was horrific. So, um, so basically, I became a shadow of Stuart, which was awful because it meant I had no freedom. And... Um, so I was working at the time, but it was getting to a point where it was too hard to get to go to work. I, but it, as it was creeping up on me, I was mm. still working. And I was, but it started off with anxiety attacks, which then became panic attacks. So it was the panic attacks, actually, that created the agoraphobia. Because right. having mm. the panic attacks, then that was right. That was how it actually happened. The panic attacks created the fear of going outside and having a panic attack and feeling so out of control. Yeah. Then consolidated with all the other things. Mm -hmm. That's how I kind of got to a point. Well, I don't want to go outside and have a panic attack and look like a fool in front of everyone. And don't want to stay in the house and have a panic attack on my own in case I die. So that's kind of, mm -hmm. I think, when I think back now, that was probably how it all yeah. sort of unfolded. So I just became a shadow with him. So I used to go down to the farm and um, he had racehorses and I used to ride out. Uh, the racehorses every day. I, after, well, I left my job. So going back, sorry, I'm sort of muddling oh, here. It's fine. It's so good. left my job because it was getting too much, the panic attacks and everything. And then um, my husband had retail milk rounds. So I used to get up at quarter to three in the morning, deliver the milk with him so I wasn't left on my own, go back to bed, get back up again, and then go out again and ride the racehorses out just so that I wasn't on my own. But the getting out and forcing myself to get out and doing that so rather than just staying in this I really pushed myself through it and I think that comes through in the book with everything that I do I push myself through even though I'm frightened and gradually step by step baby steps which is why the I can methods written how it is um I eventually broke free but it was bloody hard work oh I bet it was and I was struggling to understand that until you mentioned the words panic attacks yeah yeah and yeah, they're horrific. Yeah, I, I horrific. Wish would haven't had them for many, many yeah. years. I had them in my uh, late teenage years. Yes. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I was just going to university uh -huh. and I would get them mm -hmm. all the time. And yeah. yeah, again, I pushed through it, but it was yes. so hard. And you just, you did think you were going to die sometimes. Because you can't breathe. You see, that yeah. was the thing with me. I felt I couldn't breathe. And that's what really scared me. So that was what scared me about being outside and being humiliated of have ha you, you know, having a, a panic attack outside and everyone seeing me and thinking she's crazy. Yes. That was what really I, terrified me, me about going mm. outside. Yeah. And what what frightened me about being left in, inside on my own was if I, because I, I felt I couldn't breathe and I felt claustrophobic and I was thinking I was going to die if I was left on my own. So it was, it was um, definitely a major yeah. impact the panic attacks had on me. Yeah, I, I totally even forgot that I'd had them, yeah, but awful God. things. And for me, I don't know if it was the same for you. It wasn't that I was sat there worrying, thinking mm. I'm going to have a panic attack, mm. which brought one All of a sudden, it would just be this physiological that's response exactly right. to nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's, so then I would start panicking that yeah. I was having, that that's I was exactly, panicking. That's <laughs> exactly what happens, exactly. Yeah. And it goes round in a vicious circle, mm. in a vicious circle. Yeah, and you're yeah. right. I can't remember a time you just slowly push forward yeah. until you break that cycle yeah but yeah mm. horrific mm -hmm. I still don't think we know that much about them mm. and why we have them I think that they are if you think of disease you're in dis-ease yes and I think your panic attacks are telling you that hey listen up there's something in your life not right and you're not listening mm. I'm trying to tell you that there's something not right oh, listen up here mm. Start looking around, what isn't right? What are you putting up with that you shouldn't be? And I'm a little witch's warning to tell you that life ain't right. Sort yourself out. Yeah, you're right. That was my body because then I got quite ill with this mm. virus. I was doing too much swimming, too much mm. sport, too much schoolwork. Yeah. And that was how it started re to represent itself. But yes. I'm only just putting the pieces together now yeah. based on our chat. Yes. Um, but yeah, very, very tough times. Mm. And we've, you've talked about that pushing through. Yeah. I think 
a lot of people face adversity and anxiety and mental health problems, mm. but perhaps they don't push through. And mm. I know every le- every problem's different. Yes. But do you think that's the solution to kind of push through? Everybody's different. Mm. People handle things differently. I don't know what the uh, what the alternative is mm. if you don't. Yeah. You good know. Point. So it's like, but if you're not gonna flick that mindset from the fixed if I just can't do this I can't do this to a growth I'm going to give it a go I'll do my damn best mm. and if I don't know how I'll get someone to help me what's the alternative yeah. you die saying I wished I had rather than I'm glad I did yeah absolutely was there a turning point for you going through that <laughs> phase in your life um well I think becoming a mum was definitely a pivotal point for me because I never felt loved until I was a mum. Oh, that's so sad. And I'd never felt love. Well, maybe it was just me, who I was. But, yeah. you know, because I know that like my granny and granda, they were very, very loving. So, you know, and, and I, I loved that environment that I was with. My mum and dad are great people as well, but, you know, it was like that sort of nurturing love. And as soon as I held my son, I just knew what love was. It was like, wow, this is something really different. I've never experienced this before. Mm. And I get emotional thinking about it because it was just like, it is. It's just, it's mega being a mum. Oh, it is. And funnily enough, with the last guest we were talking about this, so I mentioned it was sad, but it's beautiful as well. Yeah. The fact that you, I guess maybe it's just that whole next level of love. Yeah, it's, isn't totally it? ne- it's a totally different level. Yeah. It's like, you know, and not everyone wants to be a mum. And that's absolutely right, too. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. So I'm not saying like, hey, God, this is the this is what you have to do. I'm not. I'm just saying for me, being a mum is the best job, but the most challenging the hardest, the toughest, the most emotional roller coaster I've ever ridden. But I tell you what, I wouldn't, I wouldn't swap it for the world. No, I agree. And yeah. Were you a maternal person before you had William? Uh, I, um, I don't know really. I'm, all, I'm always sort of, yeah, I sort of like kids and things like that, you know. But it's nothing like your own, is there? Oh yes, you know yeah. I mean? It's mm-hmm. just totally different, isn't it? Yeah, I I used to say I don't class my, didn't class myself as yeah, maternal before yeah. I had them, but then someone said, "Oh, but you were so loving with your dogs." Yeah, and I was that's like, well, probably actually, it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I probably was because I had a, I had always had my own little dog, <laughs> and I always you know went everywhere I went. So yeah. <laughs> probably mm-hmm. yes. Oh, brilliant! And do you still struggle with anxiety today? Um. I wouldn't say the word is struggle. Okay. But I would say sometimes it rears its head and I need to put it back in its box. Okay. Well, actually, I don't want to put it in this box. That's not what I want because if I put it in its box, I'm putting it somewhere. I need to just tell it to do one. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so sometimes, yeah, if it, you know, there can be times depending on what's going on. You know, if I'm tired mm-hmm. and if I've got a lot going on and... Um, you know, I'm being emotionally and mentally challenged. Sometimes you can feel a bit anxious, especially if you're driving somewhere and you've got to be somewhere in a hurry and dirty, dirty, dirty. Then, yeah, sometimes it can creep up. Like, it wasn't that long ago I had a panic attack getting on a motorway just outside of Darlington, getting oh, onto really? the A1. Right. And it came from nowhere, absolutely nowhere. And it was because my aunt was very ill and dying of cancer and she's just passed away. Oh. And... I was caring, you know, like supporting her through it. And I was finding it very challenging because seeing her die of cancer when I've been diagnosed twice with cancer, it was awful to see her, but it was awful to see that that may have been me. And I felt at times very out of control. And I believe that must have kicked off that feeling out of control that Mm -hmm. that time I was going through. So I've got to be aware of that. And I've got to explain to myself back to, hey, you're safe, you're okay. And sometimes talk myself out of that, you know. Yeah, do you almost feel more pressure that you, you've you got to handle anxiety because that's kind of what you do as part of your mentor side of yeah, things? Yeah, it's, uh, I think, to be honest, it's, I haven't met a client who I have, you know, who I'm, who I mentor, you know, from all different walks of life, CEOs with multi-million pound businesses to small business owners, Their mantra is very the same. They're very busy people. They're very, they've got a lot on their plate and they do feel anxiety, you know, and they do suffer from panic attacks. And again, it's because we've got that little voice saying, hey, listen, you're taking on too much or you're feeling out of control. So we're wanting to say to you, 
take a step back and look at what where you feel out of control in your life. You need to set some boundaries. And I just think that's what your panic attacks are telling you. Mm. So if you can reframe it, instead of being scared of them, just say, oh, hang on, I can feel you here. What are you trying to tell me? What's the message? What's the message that you've got for me? Why are you making me feel like this? What are you wanting me to to change? Mm. That's so reframe it. That's really important and something I'm certainly guilty of. Mm. Um, we've mentioned pushing through things and mm. sometimes I'm like, if something's making me anxious, I'm going to push through even harder. Yes, yeah. But sometimes when I've kind of got myself into kind of bad states of mind, yeah. it's because I haven't listened to how I'm feeling. That's right. And I think that's important because if you don't, it is going to catch up with you and keep going on and on and on because you, you've got to break the cycle. Mm. Mm-hmm. Isn't yeah. it crazy, though, that so many you know, high-flying people, you just think, mm. oh, they don't have anxiety. Oh, yeah. It's you know, mega. They're, they're it's great. amazing. And from the outside, you know, you, you would look at everybody. Uh, who, you know, people come through my door, and I'm sure the people look at me and would have thought if I hadn't shared my story, which I do because I want people to feel it's okay to talk about it because I want them to have a better life. I want them to realise their potential. And they aren't going to do that while they're carrying this no, load that's really it's just going to weigh them down so if people want to realize their true potential and live that purposeful life then they've got to stop being in denial and and work through what it is whatever that it is and that's what what I do and and I think that's what happens with these high performers they get frustrated that they can't get to a certain point it's like being on a bungee run mm. And until they look at what's going on in their personal life, because I honestly believe it's 90% of their personal life which impacts on them pushing that meaningful goal over the line. And sometimes they don't want to take the, that, you know, sometimes they don't want to scratch that, that wound mm. and open it up. But sometimes you've got to open that wound up to heal it and get it cleaned out properly. And then you can... Oh, so many questions from what you just said. It's all, I totally believe it's all right. Yeah. You know, even that's why this podcast come about. Mm. It's about the personal. That's right. That matters so much in business. And people say there's a line in between them, but there's not. Nah, it flows in not. and out. I read some, I, I love the bullshit on LinkedIn. Oh God, sometimes, <laughs> I, honestly, I just have to sit back and roll my eyes. Someone said the other day, um, now you've got to remember that you are not your business. If you're a founder, you are not your business. You've got to remember that. And I'm sitting there thinking, that's really interesting that because for me to, to achieve what I've achieved in my business, my business runs through my veins. It's my lifeblood. And I don't know another entrepreneur who's a high performer whose business doesn't run through their veins. Now, I totally understand that you have to be present in what you do. So like if I'm watching my son ride, I don't answer an email if I'm in a competition. I watch him ride and I'm totally present in what he's doing. But when he comes out of the ring, if I've got an email there and I need to respond to it, I'll respond to it. Why shouldn't I? My business makes me happy. My son makes me happy. I'm happy. So why do I need to have these fixed walls between my business and my home? I don't. I just need to be present in what I do, enjoy what I do. And the things I don't like doing, delegate. The things I don't want to do, don't do, which only leaves me the things I love. So why do I need boundaries? Yeah, totally. Because then they're expecting you to have boundaries in your brain between personal yeah. and work, and you just don't. Mine it's just impossible. flows. Mine yeah. flows because I have. Mine flows because I choose to be present in whatever I'm doing. That means the most at that time. That's quite a skill, though. How do you do that? By that, by so so. For example, if I'm walking my dog, right, that hour is my hour. I'm not going to like my son said to me the other day. We were out walking, and he said, "I wouldn't pick my phone up, you know, Mum, when we're walking." I don't want to pick my phone up because this time is like, you know, we're out in the country and it's beautiful views and, That's lovely. and I'm with my dogs and it's absolutely lovely. And I'm like, yeah, I, I wouldn't pick my phone up either because there's nothing can't wait and there's nothing more important in that hour than me being with my son and walking the dogs. Mm. And when we get in the car, I'll get my phone out and I'll just have a little look. Anything important there? No, nope, right there, get back. And then when something's important in my business... You know, like now I'm talking to you. I'm not checking my phone or I'm not worrying about doing I'm present with you. Mm. So it's just about learning that when you're present, be present. And if you're doing something that's important for your business, you focus on your business and your family and your friends or whoever understand that, hey, for this period, I'm focusing on my business. Mm. It's just it's just by 
I think it's just creating that that lifestyle, isn't it? Yeah, no, I agree. And it's, it's something I have to work on, though, because mm. sometimes I've got my daughter who, you know, she might be asleep. Yeah. So I'm checking my emails, but I really yes. should just be like loving that moment. And yeah. I feel I need to get better at it. I'm definitely getting a lot better now yeah. that I've got the children on yes. my phones away so much more yes. at home than it used to be. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it just all goes back to that, you know, personal and, and work. It's just mm. all one and the same. And mm -hmm. this is a really controversial question that I didn't mm. plan necessarily mm. on asking, yeah, but it's yeah, just yeah. coming up. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a lot of your clients, their their kind of personal problems interfere with mm -hmm. their growth mm -hmm. and where they go to yes. in their business too. Mm -hmm. How much is sometimes is that their partner that they're with in terms um, of shared responsibility at the home? And Well, sometimes it is that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is their partner. Often it's their parents. Right. And it goes right back to childhood. Oh, interesting. And there's an awful lot of self-limiting beliefs stem from childhood. Right. And it's those little self-limiting beliefs that nag, that little root, that annoying root that is, you know, causing the wrangle and the tangle and it needs unravelling. Um, but yes, there are uh, partners who, even though the the female is the breadwinner, even though, you know, and especially I had this through the pandemic, um, a high performing female was still being expected, even though she was out earning a partner, to be responsible for the children's childcare and everything else that was going on with the home, as well as trying to juggle a business. And I do see that a lot. I do see that a lot in my clients, and that is restricting them because they haven't got the time. So what I have to do is I have to sort of tr teach them, show them how to, to do the delegating. Mm. And, and often we have to do that. We have to put some, that, that's where they do have to put some firm boundaries in. Mm -hmm. They are different. <clears throat> boundaries those they are you know yeah you need to be stepping up and doing this and mm, I chat about yeah. it a lot with some of my female friends mm. and they're and a lot of them are business owners yeah and they're saying that women are sometimes automatically handicapped yes and this isn't all mm. you no you know it's, it's just but this is our experiences yes because they not only have to run the business but yeah. they also have to plan their, their son's swimming lessons that's exactly plan right. their daughter's mm. dentist appointment yeah and you know my potentially take work out take time out of their diary and cancel meetings to take their children to doctors, appointments, or or do whatever. When the other partner, you know, may not be, you know, in in a role that is just delivering the income that they need as a family, but still doesn't think it's their responsibility to step up and and do these things. I know, and I, I think slowly we're changing that. Mm. But and sometimes it is our responsibility to just yes. say, Look, can you do this, please? Yeah, it and, is. And, you know, you'd like to think that the people would. You know, yeah. I, don't, I don't want to get into a sexism no, conversation here. No, 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 but... because not everybody is like that. No. That isn't mm -hmm. everybody. You know, my husband's very, very good. Mm -hmm. He um, he does an awful lot to, to to facilitate me doing what I do and grow my business, you know, at home and so forth. So I can't use this as a generalisation that all men are. No, mm, no, my husband's know, really good. And that, mm -hmm. that's exactly it, you know, and I think you need that. To, to you really need that support definitely to... but I wonder if sometimes I get that support mm. because I demand it almost yes, and yes, it's that's about right. us stepping up and saying yeah. no hang on you d you need to do this that's you right. know I'm working all tonight yeah. so yeah and I think it's you've got to be brutally honest as well because if they're not why mm. yeah absolutely. why are they not putting your putting you first or why are they not helping you be the best version of yourself mm-hmm and if that, well, that poses a completely different it does. question, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It's just interesting times, I feel, because mm. things are changing. Yeah. And, you know, like I say, it's not, it's, it's generalising a lot by saying these things, yes. but it's just, it's interesting. Mm. It is, and it definitely does come out. It definitely does come out with, with some of my clients, definitely, mm. yeah. Interesting. Um, I've got a question going back to the anxiety side mm -hmm. of things. Do you think you can be happy and anxious at the same time? Um, well, it depends where your anxiety is showing itself, doesn't it? I think the reality is that you can have a level of happiness, but you'll not have inner peace. Yeah. And inner peace is true happiness. Yeah. It's just, yeah, I'm really, really so happy. You know mm. how much I wanted to complete my family yes. and everything like that. But still, like having another child has brought yeah. so many more anxieties because I'm yes. just like, oh, is she okay? And yeah. there's another extra person to worry about. Yes. Um, so yeah, it's just something. I don't think you'll ever, would you even want to get rid of anxiety anyway? I was... Because, you know what I mean? There's, it's still, there's different levels of anxiety, yeah? If you've got crippling anxiety that is debilitating, 
then I don't believe you could be truly happy because you've got something going on that's telling you something's wrong. But if you've got anxiety about, you know, like I'll, I'll get anxiety about every time William gets in a car and goes somewhere. Well, that's normal because yeah. I want him home in one piece mm-hmm. and I'm worried. You know, every time he gets on a horse and he goes and does something crazy, I'm like, oh my God, you know, come back in one piece. That's good anxiety because that's normal because mm. that's saying, that's your protective mechanism saying, hey, come on, you know, just be sure that that's okay. You need that. You need that buffer, don't you, to keep you, to keep you safe. Yeah. But it's when it becomes something that stops you doing something that you're passionate about, stops you living your purpose, then I think, the answer is you probably can't. You've got to work through what's the problem, I think. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I think sometimes anxiety it also drives me mm-hmm. um, yeah. to be the best I can. That's because right. There's a little element of doubt in yeah. there. Whereas, yes, sometimes it'd be nice to just be like, brilliant, I'm really happy, I'm really successful, mm-hmm. but then maybe I wouldn't go any further. That's it. That, that's exactly it. You, again, you know, it's um, that's a comfort zone, isn't it? Mm. That's where you, you stay. Whereas, and some people are really happy in this comfort zone. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm. There's people who do the same job every day for 30 years and they're really happy. That's fine. And everybody should do what makes them happy. But if it isn't making you happy and you stay and it goes back again, if something is making you stay in a comfort zone, but you don't really want to be there. Again, there's a problem. There's a problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, really interesting. And I know in the book you mentioned about driving, and mm-hmm. yeah, I think a lot of people go through that as well. Yeah. And I was going to ask, like, how how are you with driving now? Yeah, but then you yeah. mentioned the panic attack earlier. Are yeah. you Are you confident? Enough I am. Now? I love. I mean, I love driving, but I've I've got my HGV class too. That's amazing. And, um, <laughs> but the problem I have with that is I'm actually still not too keen on driving the big wagon. I don't blame you. But I have to say, this is a 35-foot wagon with five horses behind you and a big living behind that. And and the roads are so different now. These motorways are so different. You know, and I don't think it's necessarily an anxiety that's wrong because, you know, you're getting cut up left, right and centre and I don't really want to do that. So I don't know if, if it's anxiety stopping me or just common sense. In your book, you talk about having a guardian angel. Yes. I love that. Yeah. Do you have any idea who it is? I don't, but I'm bloody thankful for whoever it is because, by God, they've pulled me out of some shit. Yeah. <laughs> for people who haven't read your book, tell us about the times you felt about your guardian oh angel. Oh, my God. Well, so many times. I mean, the most um, important time they showed up and stepped up was was, was my cancer diagnosis because, mm. uh, and funny enough, it was in Middlesbrough that it was diagnosed. Yeah. And um, my mother and her vanity taking us off to get um, some facials, these, I don't know what they were, some bloody electrical type thing, tight skin tightening or something. And um, we came here to see a skin specialist, some clinic somewhere. And this guy looked at my face and he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he went, oh, and he saw this mole on the side of my head. And it was like, um, how long we had that mole and has it ever bled? And yeah, has it ever itched? Yeah. Oh, I don't like the look of it. And I'm a bit like, well, what What do you know? Kind of thing. You know, why would you say that? Uh, are you trying to frighten me type of thing? It's like, mm. no, I'm actually um, a skin cancer specialist in my other life. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and maybe we'll listen to what you've got to say. Mm. And he said, I want you get that checked out immediately. Walked into the car park, rang the Nuffield. And I was like, I need to see somebody there's something going on here yeah and uh sure enough i had malignant melanoma and if i hadn't been found out and i got in my lymph nodes i'd have been so i honestly believe that you know mum organized this appointment with this specific guy because somebody else might not have picked that up Mm -hmm. and then what happened so that was strike one then i went to the nuffield and i sat down with the the specialist but he wasn't actually a a skin cancer specialist he was just gonna be a surgeon who was going to remove it and he was like, well, and I was like scared of hospitals. So I said, look, if there's any chance, we could just leave it a bit longer and see what happens. And he was like, well, all right, then we could leave it maybe six months because he probably didn't really understand maybe the severity of it at that point. And you'll have to come back and then, you know, we'll see what it's like and maybe take it off then. But, you know, see what's what. Because at that point, he wouldn't have known it was malignant melanoma. And that guy just thought it didn't look okay. Right. So uh, I said, right, that's great because I don't really want to have an operation. So I walked out and I put my hand on the door to leave. And it was like, get yourself back in there. Sit down. You are not leaving this room. And that's what this like this force was telling me. So I turned around. And I was like, 
actually, I've changed my mind. Will you take it off, please, as soon as you can? And he did. And sure enough, it was malignant melanoma. And I had to go back and have another operation and have a, like, nobody really can see it because of my specialist. Such a good surgeon. Yeah, I would have never known. 13 stitches right down the side of my face. But I mean, honestly, he's stitching absolutely fantastic. The sewn bee would be well impressed. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, really good. And uh, so, yeah, so that was then. So they, again, got me in there. And then that got me into a system. And then I had it, I diagnosed it again the year after. Um, so I do really think that, you know, there's somebody keeps me, keeps me right. There's all sorts of things that, you know, but they were the most important. That was the biggest. Yeah, yeah definitely. Oh, definitely. And I love that side. I've, I've always felt like I've had a guardian angel, yeah. but it feels like it's my grandfather yeah. who died when I was about three. Yeah, right. I've got no reason to believe that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's that thing of believing it brings me comfort. That's but right. And I think it would be, I, I, I think I'm like you. I think it's my granny. You know, yeah. I used to call her Minnie. Mm -hmm. And I always think she's like looking out for me. I read her, her and my grand, I say that and then straight away my granda comes into my mind that as soon as I say that, it's like, no, we're both there for you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, he's like, don't lovely. forget me. I'm, you yeah. know, and it's like, no, yeah, I think I think they're both there still. Yeah. And it, again, we've got no reason to think that. No. I just feel it's present. Makes, makes me feel happy thinking yeah, that. Yeah, it does make me feel happy. But strange, like, like even like sometimes when I really feel his presence, I can smell cigar smoke. Oh, right. So that is and very. Yeah. yeah. And, and I get goose pimples now talking yeah. about it. And I, I just, yeah. And that's just, so nice for you to have that. And that's, you know, because that is. It is special, and especially if you can actually smell it as well. Yeah. I mean, that is but it's so such a comfort, though. Yeah. I wouldn't try and analyse that. I would just go with it and enjoy it. Oh, I want to overanalyze. That's, that's <laughs> go in with my it nature. and enjoy it. <laughs> but, but yeah, it, it does. It does bring me yeah. comfort. And there's been times in life like you where you've yeah. had those messages. And you think, is this just my subconscious? Yes. You know, mm. telling me my gut feeling and everything yeah. like that. And again, maybe we read too much into it. Yeah. But if it brings us joy and comfort, does then I guess it. that's okay. Yeah. Um, are there any other unexplained experiences that you've had in your life, like spiritual sides or anything like that? Not really. I no. wouldn't say. Not really. Not that I can think of. Do you believe in kind of ghosts and spirits? Well, I believe in my angels because they've really pulled it out of the bag so many times I couldn't not really. Mm. Spirits and things? I believe in gin and tonic. Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> That is the best answer <laughs> out of everything. I love it. <laughs> does does do, do, you know? Do you, just don't, I know you just mentioned it in passing. Yeah, as a joke. Yeah. Do you turn to alcohol a lot to help no, you through? No. Not at all. The absolute opposite. Absolute opposite. If there's anything I've got to deal with that is serious going down, I have to do it on an absolute clear head. I'm exactly Never, ever. I'm exactly the, the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm exactly the same. Yeah. I knew in the pandemic when it was all tough for business. Yeah. It, I didn't want to just start leaning on alcohol because no. I do have quite an addictive personality. Uh -huh. And I know it, it was just so well, I, I lent on caffeine instead. Yeah, yeah. And then I was drinking far too much coffee. Uh -huh. yes. I mean, it sounds like no, silly, I know what you mean. but yeah. 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 So, yeah, it, it's it's strange that you're like that because uh -huh. not many people are. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah no, I'm a good drink. I'm it helps me unwind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, yeah. I've always felt that way too. Um, alternative therapies. Yes. I think you touched on that them. in your book. Yeah, me too. Love what them. are you into? I love Reiki. Mm -hmm. I want to. Um, uh, uh, there's 101 things to do before you die that I've just signed up to with Laura Kingston and Charlie Grabham Brilliant. on um, Instagram. And one of the things I want to do is become a Reiki master. Reiki was very much um, very helpful along with homeopathy um, and the Alexander technique when I wasn't well and was trying to recover from my uh, agoraphobia and so forth. And I really do find holistic um, health fascinating and I enjoy it very much and I always turn to to that if I feel like I need to boost my energy levels that's my that's my go-to yeah me yeah. too again I've learned that through life like Reiki yeah. and then I had this amazing crystal Reiki oh, um, good. when I was going through my miscarriages yeah, yeah. and it helped me as crazy as it sounds it helped me forgive my body yeah no and I you, get it and I look at these little rocks and I'm just like really yeah, yeah. but 
It works. You'll have to tell me after this where you went because I would love something like that. Oh, I know. She doesn't yeah. do it anymore. Oh. I know. I was just like, <laughs> like, please. She's got her job. She just, yeah, it's yeah. such a shame. Uh-huh. But she's amazing. Well, I'll there still, must be somebody. Yeah, I'll, there, there will be other people. She'll probably yeah. know, actually. So I'll yeah. connect you yeah. with her. She's an amazing lady. And uh-huh. I still kind of, and obviously, there was a lot of doctors involved yeah, and everything yeah, to get yeah, my second yeah. daughter. Oh, but I still give how her. How wonderful for you. Oh, that. I know. Oh, I was I know. so happy when I heard that. I know, because I think I met you when I was going through it and everything. the walk and everything. I, I was know. Just so overjoyed for you. I know. I think we met each other at the right time because you were yes. so upset about losing your oh, dog, God, yeah. and then I was upset about oh, no. that that sort of thing. Yeah. So yeah, but, but yeah, it's brilliant. Thank yeah. Um, is there anything because you really kind of poured your heart out into <laughs> this book, and yeah. it, you can tell, and it, it it makes you be able to relate to you yes. so much more. Yeah. Is there anything that you weren't able to mention in the book? Um. There was things I didn't put in the book because I thought some of the people didn't deserve the airtime. Fair enough. Um, and not really. I mean, you could have. I could have expanded on everything, but then it would become mundane. And what I wanted it to be was relatable, you know. And I didn't want it to be like a sob story. I wanted it to be relatable so that, you know. People, anybody who was going through, it's not often someone's going to go through everything I've been through. But if someone was going through one of the things, I wanted it to be relate, relatable and supportive. So I didn't see the point in droning on, just giving them a sharp, sharp, this is what happened, this is how I got over it, and this is what you can do. I thought that was you. nice, actually. And that's really what it's about. You yeah. know, it's trying to, rather than someone going, oh, poor her. It's about, hang on a minute, it's about... If this is me, and I've had so many people say, you know, I've so many messages saying, God, I thought this was going to be a self-help book, but you've really cleverly done it where I'm reading the book about you, but I'm instantly thinking about me and it's making me think about my life. Yeah. And then you tell me, you know, you not tell, you, you, you share with me ideas to make me think about how I could move forward. And then I think, yes. Because that's exactly what the purpose of the book was. Brilliant. And you, the great thing about having been through so much is there's something for everyone. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> Bless you. There is. Shit, uh, I've been through a lot. I <laughs> know. Uh, and one final question yeah. that I have uh-huh. that is just that one thing that really, I don't know, it didn't, I just kind of really felt for you because, again, it kind of shows what's going on beneath the surface. Mm. When you were winning so many awards yeah. at the height of your yeah. career Bad. from one business, yeah. You said you were at the lowest point I was personally. Absolutely felt like shit. That's just crazy. Yeah, and you've from bear this it. is I know you talk about it a lot, but it's so mm. important to talk about mm. imposter syndrome. Yeah. I couldn't bear it. I was winning all those awards and I was literally just like a zombie. I was so ill because I was really ill. Uh, I was going through the menopause. I'd just been given a, um I was on Zolidox, which was um I was thirty eight and um they'd injected me to put me into a chemical menopause mm. to so I could have an operation. And um, my head all fallen out. So when I won Most Promising Business in the United Kingdom at the Guildhall in London, I should have been like bouncing off the ceiling with joy. And uh, I was like, get me out of here. Just get me to back into my room. My head all fallen out. The picture, there's a picture of me getting the award. I look horrific. I hate looking at it. So it was like there's just so much going on. And then I ended up going into the menopause and I never came out. So I had a menopause, at like started the menopause at 38 and that was it. I never came out of it, really. So there was that going on and then all the other stuff and, and thinking, oh, my God, you know, do I deserve this after what? Not, like you say, all that imposter syndrome crap. And it took a long time to to think, actually, yes, I bloody did. <laughs> well, I'm glad you've got to that point. <laughs> I'm at that point now. Fantastic. And you can be proud of yourself. Yes, and- I am. Brilliant. That's lovely. Well, thank you so much for answering oh, all those difficult thank questions. Thank you for having me. I do have the the kind of regular question yes, feature. Fire away. I will. And so it's kind of quick fire questions yeah. on a scale of one to ten. Okay. One being the worst, ten being the best. Yes. How you rate yourself at various elements. Okay, go for okay, it. Okay, number one, how good looking are you? Oh, God, 11. Brilliant. <laughs> how funny are you? 11. You're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> what are your Sick. cooking skills like? I'm all right, eight maybe. Oh, that's yeah, decent. I'm all right. Singing? I love singing. Um, Are you good? Mm, that's a seven. Okay, that's yeah, really good. I like singing. Um, we've touched on it. Alcohol? How good are you at drinking oh, alcohol? Give it, no, let's say six maybe. Right, I'm okay. Uh, parenting skills? Oh, I'd like to think I was a good mum. Say eight because I still cock up. 
Yeah, we all do, don't we? <laughs> um, how good a friend are you? I really would like to think I'm a good friend. It. Fantastic. How intelligent are you? Oh, I'm not that bright to tell you the truth. I don't know. <laughs> Six, six maybe oh, but this is a trick question because <laughs> you're intelligent in different ways aren't you yeah you I'm know. not that bright I think I just have entrepreneurial flair maybe oh, no, <laughs> I disagree how kind are you oh I'm pretty kind is it yeah excellent and finally how good at sex are you oh god I'd rather eat a chocolate orange I don't know five <laughs> <laughs> we should get Stuart in for that question shouldn't we <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, you've been such a good guest. Thank you so much. Oh, that's been really good for you. You really are a really inspiring lady. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.